the last session, I said welcome to Friday to everybody. So now I know it's Saturday. We're all good. Um, I'm Tess from WordPress VIP at Automatic, and I'm delighted to introduce you to our next speaker. Poom is a software engineer who loves plushies. And Poom is here to help us navigate the vast world of headless WordPress frameworks. Please welcome Poom. Thank you. All right, so hello everyone. My name is Poom and this is my plushie, Lollipop and Butter. <laughs> yeah, so, so I'm Poom. So today I'm, I want to talk about like a little bit about the current state of JavaScript ecosystem because I think it can be a little bit intimidating. But at first, let me introduce myself. So my name is Poom, Poom Print Mano, and I'm mostly a software engineer. But actually I do like quite a lot of community stuff back in Thailand as well. I'm from Bangkok, Thailand. And actually a lot of people in Thailand WordPress community is also engaged with like a lot of other communities. Like a lot of them are in like JavaScript communities and we do projects together. For example, we have a hackathon about Ghost. So we have like a hackathon where we build interactive systems that will bring Ghost to life. I also like the thing about me is I'm not only interested in communities, but in, I'm interested in what the web can do, like what the interactive web has the capacity to do. So um, I actually have a show at the National Theatre that's going on from yesterday to tomorrow, where I, ex where I actually built an AI that can help the machine learns how to dance. So we take the data from like all the Thai traditional dances, the 59 dance positions, and we turn it into an AI that can interact with dancers. I have this like profound love of the web and its interactivity because like most things I build with is with TypeScript and it's like surprisingly flexible. For example, like I have built like a computer project where you can like build your own sound, your own music by writing assembly and connecting it together. Or like there's a project that sends a hardware to space using JavaScript. Like I'm very glad that didn't crash in space. So like I have this love of interactivity that's kind of hard to describe, but I think when you see the web, a lot of people see content and I agree content is king. Although there's so much that can be done with JavaScript. So with that, I want to open this talk with a very simple question. What kind of sites can you build with WordPress? So it seems like a very simple question. Like a lot of you already seen what size can be, but play with me for a moment. Um, I'm going to play a very simple game. If you think the website I'm going to show can be with WordPress, just raise your hand. So I'm gonna start. Can this be built with WordPress? This is the first, this is the first website if you don't know. This is the first like homepage of the World Wide Web by Tim Berners-Lee. So it's back when the internet was started. So if you were to do this with WordPress, you would maybe strip out all the themes and you would get this nice looking page. All right, let's move on. Can this be built with WordPress? Can it, can it? Ah, yes. Actually, this site is built with WordPress. So this is a space news website in Thailand, Space TH. He's also, I think, a speaker today. So this is built with like a WordPress theme. So very simple, very clean, a little bit of interactivity. Now let's move on to something that's a bit more complex. So this is actually a registration system for like an event in a political party, and it kind of pulls in all the information from a central database. This is more complex, so can WordPress do this? Can it? Ah, I think a lot of people have faith in WordPress. Let's move on to something completely different. Imagine a 3D world. Uh, this is called the Museum of Annoying Experience by Sendesk. So when you go into this website, it's actually a completely 3D world. You can see on the left here, you're in like an empty space. You can use your arrow key to move like in a video game, and you can check out the artifacts. Can this be built with WordPress? I think this is surprising, only three people went up. Like when we talk about the previous websites, everyone knows that WordPress can do this. But why not this? A lot of websites today are becoming a bit more interactive. Imagine when you're buying a new car, maybe a BMW, then there's a lot of interactive components. You have to be able to customize something in your car. So what if I tell you everything that you can see, including that museum, can be built perfectly with WordPress? So this is what today's talk is gonna be about. 
What if you can build your own front end? It can be as complex or as simple as you want, but you use the WordPress as the source of content. Because if you look in every website, even though it's really complex, it has 3D, it's been sent to space, all it has in common is it has a content. And this is what WordPress really shines, a tool for content authoring. So this, uh, for those of you who don't know, actually, who here has used WordPress, headless WordPress before? Almost everyone. So I think you already know the deal. So uh, for, I think, the rest of you who didn't know, to put it very simply, headless WordPress is all about using WordPress as a content database. You have, you have all your content, your orders are extremely familiar with the WordPress dashboard. Like Gutenberg is really awesome. So you can continue to use that, but you have the choice to use an API like GraphQL or JSON to pull the data into a different system, right? But I think I want to, I want to kind of preface with a caution because you might not need headless WordPress. So the site I showed you earlier, the Space TH website, this is, this is like a very large site. So this site is the number one visited space website in Asia. So according to the statistics, and there are like a lot of concurrent users. But surprisingly, it's 100% on regular WordPress. So it's using a WordPress theme called Seed Themes, which is made from people from Thailand, my home country, very proud. And the nice thing is that like, you don't actually need headless WordPress, even if your website has like a million or 10 million of users. But it's more dependent on how they use the website. So be very careful. Sometimes regular WordPress is just perfect. All right, so when should we go WordPress? I'm gonna speed up a little bit here. So I would say there are three things you should keep in mind when you're choosing headless WordPress. The first is scale. So with scale, there comes a point in your website where if you're using WordPress for a while, but suddenly you have a lot of plugins. Sometimes you have Elementor, sometimes you have like a dozen hundred plugins to support your functionality. Suddenly when there are tens of millions of users, your site somehow slows down. Or there are so many content types, so many content modules. How do you deal with that? Well, actually, Caching might just be the simple solution. A lot of those plugins are actually like very static. They are not dynamic. They are not per user. So chances are if you use just the right kind of caching, you would be fine. But the second type is more interesting. So as I tell you, I'm very into interactivity. I'm the kind of person who sees like these interactive websites. I'm like, oh wow, I like that. And you, and like it's not only for aesthetics, but also a lot of the times you need it, like when you're ordering a car part. So here's an example of something that you could build with WordPress. So this is a 3D customizer where you have a bag and you can kind of rotate, you can alter that bag. I mean, this looks like something that's very hard to do, but at the core of it is just content and content can be managed with WordPress. So with headless WordPress, you can bring your own 3D framework and do whatever you want. The third point is control. So a lot of times you need control in your website. Maybe you need to do some functionality that is very customized. Actually, a lot of times you can just write a WordPress plugin or WordPress theme, but there comes a time when you have to manage your own infrastructure. For example, if your website has some dynamic components that needs to be very fast, and maybe you would rather use like another tool, perhaps Golang for that. So you can do that with headless WordPress. All right, so let's get to the meat of the talk. So there are so many front-end frameworks right now. Even if you want to get started with headless WordPress, there's the green part that you have to worry about. I think the WordPress part is really easy, it's really well done, but the front-end world is just like too much. There are so many frameworks. So how do you pick one? I think everyone would have a little bit opi a strong opinion on this. There are many criteria that you can use, but from my experience, let me just pick four of them. First, you need to make sure that your framework that you're going to use supports multiple modes of rendering. 
Why is that? If you use so image in a website, right? Some a lot of the parts of a site is completely static. Like it doesn't, it can be completely cached. But there are some parts that are changed more frequently. For example, your maybe your terms of service, your terms of conditions, it doesn't really change that much. But your let's say your blog or the product just changes every minute, changes every hour. So you should have the choice to know how how often you want to refresh that, so you speed up this experience for your user. Two, it has to be flexible. A lot of tools in JavaScript ecosystem are designed for doing blocks or designed for doing e-commerce, but a lot of time, if you want to hack it, if you want to customize it, it's not available. So this is the second constraint. Third is it has to be fast. A lot of tools in JavaScript tend to use, well, a lot of JavaScript. And the problem with that is you you're putting a lot of work in the user's browser. And the problem with that is it tends to be slow. A lot of the times, like a website can be two megabytes, five megabytes, or even 10 megabytes. So we have to make sure that the framework we use doesn't use that much resource. Finally, it has to have a great defaults. Because a lot of the time you have to do everything by yourself. You want to search, do it yourself. You want a cart, do it yourself. And if you're doing a site that has really fast iteration, you can't do that. You need something that has all the great integrations like Google Analytics and other tools for monitoring built-in. But most of all, I think if you're choosing a framework for your team, it's very important to know the team part in it. A lot of shops actually force a tool upon their developers. And I think that's not right. Because if the team is experienced with one thing, a lot of the time they can make it work. Like I have seen a situation where the whole team is really good with React, but the team lead says, eh, no, nah, we're just going to go with Svelte. And it didn't work out because you need that kind of support from the team. So this is more of the technical aspect, and this is more of the human aspect. So, I know that choosing a meta framework will always be an opinion. It's, it's not something that, it's something that everyone will disagree with me and it's very normal. But here's just my tr opinions. So here's my three topics. So from my experience, I would say Astro is really great for building content sites. So that's the number one in my heart. So this is just me fanboying about Astro. <laughs> and the number, the, and the, I think core number two for me would be Nux and Swellkit. They're actually like a bit of a polar opposite. I would say Nux is more opinionated, more feature complete, while Swellkit is actually more minimal. Um, not sure how many times I have, but I'm gonna very speed up. So let's talk about Astro. Um, who here has heard about Astro before? Please raise your hand. So I think. Uh, probably 20% of the room. So that's a clear sign that it's maturing, although like not the number one default. And I think that's for a good reason. The thing about Astro is it has already been adopted in a lot of websites. And a reason for that is it's fast. It's really, really fast. Before this, the choice of JavaScript frameworks for content sites used to be Gatsby. And I have used Gatsby in a situation where we have around, let me think, 200,000 pages, like just for like the e-commerce. And imagine statically building that. That actually took us an hour and 30 minutes. So you could go walk your dog in a park and it still hasn't finished. So the thing about Astro is that it's really optimized for speed. So building like the pages, it actually like really, really fast. So let's talk about why it's so fast, not only for building, but for users. Try to guess like, well, I don't, you don't need to guess because I already wrote that, but here we are importing view component and swell component in a page. And like from your common sense, this seems wrong, right? It's like putting jQuery with React. It seems really wrong. But if you look at the bundle, it's zero kilobytes. There's suddenly no data, but how? Like what black magic is this? Well, turns out like the way Astro is designed is really awesome. It's designed to be zero JavaScript by default. So even if you're using a component, by default, it tries to render it like on the server statically. So your user's browser doesn't need to do that work. It doesn't need to download that JavaScript, so it stays fast. The way it does this is it use a concept called islands. So islands is not really a concept like for Astro only, but a more general term. So island is when 
you are in one page, it has a different framework. So maybe your top header here is on Vue.js, and maybe the image carousel is built with something different, maybe, um, maybe Svelte, maybe React, and every place can use a different library. So, and the nice thing here is you don't need to load them all at once. You can only load some JavaScript when it's, when it's really needed. For example, in this example, you know the header is gonna be mostly static, right? You don't actually need like a lot of JavaScript in that. So we don't load JavaScript and all that JavaScript is zero. But you want the Caruso to be able to be a bit of drag and droppable, so you add client load. Well, now comes the problem. Like in the website, it says that um, so Astro is really designed to be used with your favorite UI library, right? But what is your favorite UI library? If you're if you comes into like the world of JavaScript for the first time, it can be really intimidating because there's probably like a hundred thousand libraries in there. I don't know. Well, there's a talk from E1U, the creator of Vue.js, that I love so much. I always refer to this talk, like literally every time. So the talk, of, I'm sorry, so the talk from E1U here, actually, like the key message of the talk is that there's no spectrum. It's actually more of like a multi-dimensional plane of the things that you want. So for example, some websites are mostly content. Most WordPress websites, I would say, are content focused. Some web applications are focused on interactivity. For example, the AI that I made earlier, like about dancing with dancers, there's not much content, but there's a lot of interactivity. So that's why there comes a range in the framework. So there's a range for like a lot of things. For example, for React, it's like very minimal at its core, but it needs a lot of supporting libraries to work, whereas something like Angular is on the polar opposite. So I would really, really recommend this talk. <laughs> but when we talk about WordPress, I think most of us think about content sites. So my personal recommendation would be these two. Actually, I have been using React for close to eight and nine years already, but for content size, I would still recommend Vue and Svelte. I would say Vue and Svelte is a little bit of like, like an opposite. So Vue is actually more fe like feature complete, but it's really, really easy to learn. While Svelte is also really easy to learn, but it's more minimal. So that means less API surface. So personally, like right now, I really enjoy Vue because you can learn it like in really quickly, like 30 minutes, but you can like keep using it and keep growing your knowledge. Yeah, so while Svelte has a really, really minimal API surface, but a lot of the things provided is either by the ecosystem or you write it yourself because it's just so nice to write. Okay, so back to Astro. So the nice thing about Astro here is that there are so many direct tips. Sometimes imagine like the carousel. Do you really need to load the carousel if it's like the hundreds elements in a, in a website? No, you only load it once the user scrolls to it. So that's why there's directives like client visible, or maybe you have a component you only want to show on the desktop or on mobile. So you can use client media. So that means you don't need to load things that you don't need. And the ecosystem for Astro right now is not as mature as Nuxt, but it's actually really good. So you can find a lot of integration for almost every JavaScript framework and library right now. All right, so how do you use Astro with WordPress? There's actually a really nice guide here about headless WordPress. So, but the thing you have to keep in mind is that before you can even use headless WordPress, you need to know first what kind of transport are we going to use? Are we going to use REST or are we going to use GraphQL? So here's the pros and cons. If you use REST, um, it's actually really easy to use. You just call the endpoint, but you're loading a lot of data. You're loading basically like every data in that endpoint, even if you don't need it. But if you use GraphQL, it takes a little bit more to set up but you can pick and choose. You can say, I only want the page title and nothing else, and it would happily give it to you. So with WordPress, you can use WordPress GraphQL. So it's a really nice tool that you can just install, and it would give you headless WordPress. I think I, want, I can't really show the whole video. Um, I, uh, excuse me, could you speed up the video if possible? Um, if not, then it's totally fine. So in here, I have a very simple like WordPress site. 
So in here, like, what you need to do is go and install the plugin. So that's like the easy part. Yes. So once you install the plugin, it actually gives you like a menu on the top. If you see like the GraphQL IDE part, so that allows you to write your own queries. Okay. So actually, I think I'm just gonna skip the live demo, but you can come to me later, like, to see the demo. I also have it on GitHub, but for the sake of time, I'll move on to Nuxt. So let's talk about Nuxt a little bit. So I would say Nuxt is a little bit of an opposite to, like, not really an opposite, but a bit different philosophy to Astro. So with Nuxt, it's, and I think Vue.js in general, is all about easy to learn but there's just like really feature complete. So you can get started very, very easily, but there's everything that you would possibly need. I think that's the part I really like about it. So with like, as I mentioned with Vue, you just, I would say it's like low ceiling, but white walls. So there's a low barrier to entry, but you can just do pretty much everything with it. The API is really complete, but you don't need to learn it all the time. And same things go with Next. In a real website, you would need authentication, you would need page transition, you would need state management, you would need routing. So with Astro, like maybe they don't have all of this, but with Nux, it's not designed to only build a content site, but it's actually designed to build like a very complex web application. So if you're building some things like maybe a very complex e-commerce, then I would really recommend Nux just because it has that ability to support like a very complex like web use case. So everything you would possibly need, you can have it in Next. Another thing is the integration measure, uh, ecosystem is really mature. So if you need something like anything, if you need Tailwind, if you need, let's say, Google Analytics, if you need any logging, then you can do it with Next. So I would say it's like pretty mature. Another thing that I really like, and this is my number one criteria, is it should support multiple rendering modes. So let's talk about this for a bit, because I think this is the part where it gets a little bit overwhelming for people who don't usually use these frameworks. So the, by, when we talk about rendering modes, it's all about how do you want to render this page. So let's say so I'm going to quickly go through them one by one, but I recommend like reading about the last two yourself because it gets a little bit confusing. Client-side rendering is when you want the browser to do all the work. Think of something like 3D customizer. You don't really do that on the server. You do that on your browser because it's 3D. There's a lot of interaction. Server-side rendering is when you want the server to do all the work. So this is just like WordPress. Like when you, when you visit a WordPress site, the server do all the work. But then, this is the part where it gets maybe a little bit more confusing, is SSG, ISR, and SWR. So in a nutshell, SSG is when you have a page that is very popular, a page that is like people visit it and it, like, it doesn't really change much. So let's say terms and conditions or a blog post. In that case, you would just generate a website because it's really fast. And when the, page change, when the content changes, you can just refresh it. And the last two is all about continuously like revalidating. So, so actually in Nuxt, it's quite nice that you have a configuration to do it route per route. So let's see this example. In your homepage, you can just pre-render it because your homepage, let's be honest, it doesn't really change much. Your products actually changes much more often, so you can have it revalidate in the background. So for example, when you go to a product page, it might still show the old one, but after a while, it will show the new one. Or and maybe similar story with a blog. Maybe you don't always need to see the latest blog, but it can be a little bit delayed. So it's all about how fast do you want the user to see the newly updated page? Or can it be like a little bit later? Can, can it be the next deploy, or does it have to be now? So that's all what really the rendering mode means. I would recommend checking out stay while revalidate. Um, I'm not going to cover it here, but basically it's all about caching. So it's all about like making sure that you can cache the content a little bit. So if you visit it while the content is still being refreshed, you will see the old version. While if you visit it a bit later, you will see the new version. So back to Nux. The thing I love about Nux is another thing is the documentation is spectacular. So there are visuals, there are guides, there are everything. I think it's really like one of the most well-written docs I've ever seen, and it's very feature complete. 
So if you want to get started, it's quite simple. So um, I think we still have a bit more time, so here's a bit of a live demo. So I have a little bit of a Nux website here with some content set up. So if I start the server, I have like a little page here. So as you can see, this is like not in WordPress itself, but this is pulling data from WordPress. Okay, so, yeah, so here is a little bit of picture of me and my friends, and here's another content site, uh, another content. So if we go back to the code here, you can see first, first step is always to write your query. If you use REST, this would be just choosing your endpoint. So here I want to get the post by the slug, very common when you want to like get a page. And then we configure the GraphQL, which is the part, uh, uh, the GraphQL code gen, which just generates the code for you based on the queries you have. And yeah, so this is like the project structure. So it actually starts with uh, the app.view. So this is like the entry point for your website. So if you actually start our like the next project, it will start with a welcome. So it would be something like this, like with all the nice examples. But if you, yeah, but if you change it a little bit, I think this video is a little bit too slow. So if you go to next page, then it actually picks out like the data from the routing in pages. So for example, like this. So here you can see it's quite easy. First, you need to get the data from GraphQL. Second, you need to render it. I will like share the slides later, but I don't have time. So next is well kit. So this is like the core number two for me, because I think like Nux and SwellKit has like very polar opposite opinions. While Nux tries to be like easy to use, but like quite very opinionated, I think SwellKit is a lot more minimal. So I would say that's the really nice thing about Swelt. If you go to the Swell website, you would say there's not really a lot to learn. There you you would take let's say one hour and you would basically learn like almost all the API surface. So I would say the principle of Swell just really do more with less. It has like that same philosophy like thing in it where if where you just only need to learn a few key specifics and you can do a lot of things. So personally I haven't used like SwellKit as much as I've used Astro and um, Nuxt. So but I would still highly recommend giving this a try. So just to quickly wrap up, here's so here's my idea. So I would say this is my top three. So just to recap, Astro content site. If you're building a content site that has a bit of interactivity, choose Astro. If you want to do a little bit of a web app that is more complex, you need a lot more features, you need things to be more opinionated, choose Next. If you want something that is like quite minimal, but very enjoyable to work with, then choose WellKit. So, but of course, this is just my opinion. The important thing about frameworks is you need to understand the design principle of the people who created it. For example, like with WordPress, we, like, we know how welcoming the culture is, we know how accepting, and we know like, it's very focused on the people creating the content. So it's the same with understanding JavaScript frameworks. You shouldn't think of it at only on a technology basis, but also like, why the person that created these frameworks try to think this way. React is all about transforming data. Will is all about being easy to learn but can extend. Something like that. So I think once you try to understand those kind of design decisions, it really helps you to appreciate like the little JavaScript frameworks that we see in the world. So I would like to like kind of end this talk on this note. It's very important to understand that WordPress is really flexible. You can use the data capabilities in a lot of ways. So not only to build content first websites, but everywhere we go in every interactive, every system, there is content. Content will always be king and WordPress will be able to support that. And just to end on this note, there's a talk that I really like called Shoes boring technology. I think in the JavaScript world, we tend to have this kind of like shy like curiosity where we see new framework and we're like, wow, this is interesting. Or we suddenly jump to it. But in this talk, it's really interesting how like from people who have lived very long in the industry, the opinion is always to choose something that is measured because we understand it more. When WordPress breaks, everyone here knows how to fix it. Like, 
we know, I mean, maybe like not everyone, everyone, but most people like it's very mature. So we understand how WordPress works. But if you're on like another technology that you're not that familiar with, you don't have that kind of confidence. So choose something that is mature because you understand it and take that like and de just deliver value for the world. And that is my talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Pim. You might want to pick oh, yeah. this. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, thank you so much, Poom. Um, we do have some time for questions. So if you have a question for Poom, stick your hand up. We've got a microphone to come around. Do you have a question? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, please. There. Hi. Uh, so this is not strictly about the frameworks, but you did mention at the start of the talk that uh, in Bangkok, yes. there was some overlap between the WordPress and the JavaScript ah, yes. communities. And I find that super interesting because right. I don't think it's very common in my ah. experience. So do you have any idea why, how, how, what the conditions were for that to happen? Ah, yes. So I think the thing about WordPress as a community is I think we care a lot about the people. So a lot of community tends to be like very focused just on the technical aspect. Like, for example, the C++ community, like we care a lot about performance, but like in our community back in Bangkok, it's gonna take a while for me to change the slide back. But we are very focused on the human part. For example, like we used to organize the stupid hackathon, which is like the hackathon where you just go and view stupid things. So I, I'm not saying WordPress people is stupid, please don't take it that way. Yeah, but actually we say WordPress people, they're very creative. They are very like, I think they are like, very human, so in that case, like the events we organize, so it has it has a lot not only to do with technology, but a lot to do with human. For example, we have the event like creative coding. So Ty sitting there is the organizer. So he organized an event where programmers would go and code their own music. So I think that's why like we see like the white brands and the human nature of WordPress people in like those more dynamic communities. Yes, please. Hello. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much for a very insightful session. I really appreciate Thank you. So as we know that the WordPress is mainly uh, famous for the SEO as well. So which uh, one is the most SEO friendly among all these three picks uh, oh, from your topic? Great question. So actually, I think like all three like really supports like very good native SEO functionalities, but I so I would say like all of them, for example, if you go into like the Astro documentation, there's a very clear guide on how you can set up things like meta tags, set up things like sitemaps. With Nux, I'm pretty sure it's completely built in. So I would say those two would definitely be built in. As for Svelte Kit, um, I'm not actually sure because I haven't used it that much, but I'm pretty sure like all of these, you can do a lot of great SEO. One thing to like, I think think about though is that the content from like the WordPress CMS is in HTML. So it's important as well in your CMS that you have like properly formatted markups and you're ex like exporting the excerpts correctly. Yeah, so I think you follow the SEO practice in normal WordPress in your front end application. Yes, please. Hi, it was really a nice talk. Thank you. Uh, when, uh, you mentioned islands uh, and yes. we can use multiple frameworks and libraries uh, on the front end side. Yes. So uh, will it create uh, any kind of uh, conflicts while using multiple frameworks and libraries simultaneously uh, while developing the website? Ah, great question. So I think the nice thing about Astro Islands is, is encapsulation. So every island is kind of broken out into their little world. For example, Vue.js has the concept of instances. So your header and your Caruso is going to have different instances. That means they cannot directly interact with each other. And this means it's very rare that you will run into conflict. The only scenario that I can think of if is if perhaps you are using global values. So if you're done use global values, global states, then no, I think you will not run into conflicts. Thank you. We've got still a couple of minutes for questions. Oh, we have yes, one please. Here. Yeah, hi. 
Um, so recently, um, the website that we were that we were using, um, the view actually went into end of life status ah, last year, yes. right? Um, so we actually, our team actually had to do a lot of like a, a framework readjustment going from oh, NUX 2 right. to NUX 3. So are there any of these frameworks that minimizes this damage or, or if there's a framework that we can suggest to move towards to that can avoid this future um, um, where we are forced to rebuild the site basically? <laughs> Mm, I think that's a great question. Yeah, I think that has a lot to do with first, the maturity of the framework. And second is, I think, like, how minimal or like, how, like, how far the direction is going to change. So I think the change from NUX2 to NUX3 is a very good example. Like, in that case, like, it has a lot to do. I think similar to the change from view 2 to view 3, we know that's like quite a lot. So. Mm, I think like even I think I cannot give a good answer in this case because for example Astro is actually very new so even though it's gaining popularity and maturity very quickly I wouldn't like completely trust it yet so like in my mind I would say this is something that I'm still like on the lookout for like if for using it in like extremely long-term projects yeah so but to answer your question, I would say like there are some like more mature technologies like page generators, like for example Hugo, that has been around for a very long time. So uh, if you want something that would like sus survive the test of time, I would recommend looking into kind of that mature frameworks. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you so much, Poom. Thank you. We have a gift for you oh, on behalf you. of the organizers as well. Thank you so much. <laughs>